Did you know that this can become this? All thanks to these? In the cow's stomach, there is a community of species of microorganisms, not just bacteria. There are uh, fungi and viruses uh, and some other protozoa like amoeba and ciliates that all live together in the rumen of a cow and they all work together to digest the plant materials that the cows eat and ultimately contribute to the production of methane gas. Why not take advantage of this power source? Well, there's roughly about 2,000 dairies. Uh, translates to about 1.8, 1.9 million dairy cows in California. And that many cows translates into a lot of cow patties. How many, you may ask? Good question. Um, probably about 100 pounds a day of wet manure. Every day, every cow. Talk about a renewable resource. With the help of microorganisms, this can easily become natural gas. And water is used to flush the manure into a collection facility. And from that collection facility, the, the solids are separated out of the, the manure water and the effluent is then put into a digester. The gas is processed and created by bacteria for about maybe 30 to 40 days in a lagoon digester. Uh, an anaerobic digester is similar to what goes on with a cow, except it's in the absence of oxygen. Uh, and there are organisms that are anaerobes that are capable of living and metabolizing, surviving in environments without oxygen. And then out pops what is known as biogas. And biogas is methane, about 60%, give or take. And about 40% of the other stuff in there is CO2 and hydrogen sulfide and other stuff that we have to take out and clean up. Some of it goes into PG&E's natural gas pipelines. Some the dairies use to supply energy for their day-to-day -day operations. And they're hoping to expand to 50 or more dairies in the next two years. UC Berkeley's Dan Kamen sees this as a good thing for existing dairies. The normal eating and pooping cycle of a cow produces a great deal of methane. And methane is a very powerful greenhouse gas. In fact, it's over 20 times more damaging per molecule than is carbon dioxide, CO2. So if what we do is we start to build out the infrastructure so that dairies around the country start capturing these materials and then making energy out of that, that's really all, the, all for the better. The same process can be used for other waste too. There's also food waste out there. With these systems, you can treat any organic feedstock. So pg &E right now is looking very heavily at uh, treating uh, food waste from cities like San Francisco or, or Oakland and combining all of that into one facility. What happens if we start engineering microbes to create energy? It's already begun in many research labs. Locally, scientists are using E. coli and bacteria from the guts of termites to figure out how they can create sustainable biofuels. A lot of what we need to do uh, has been done by other organisms in the environment on a, you know, on a different scale. We can uh, make use of that. And if you tailor those bacteria, they can make energy out of those waste biofuel materials, whether it's wood or the husk of a corn or ocean algae, all those things could be utilized to make a sustainable source of bioenergy. What's most exciting is the fact that it might work uh, and that we really have the potential to resolve this problem uh, of uh, the shortage of fossil fuels. But we need to be cautious about some of these solutions. The issue with all of these biofuels is that at some level they compete with nature. That if we're going to grow crops, that's land that could be feeding people or we're doing it at the expense of cutting down forests or growing bacteria in the ocean. And so there's a tension. And as the population of the planet rises, the question is, how much land can we spare for nature? So these biofuels look attractive. But if I were to sort of place my bets, I would say there are other things that may be more attractive, knowing that in the end, we're likely to have a mix of all of these. 